more and more people simply just look to those things and whatever comes up first and whatever they've been told, even if they haven't been trained in it, they say, oh, well, that must be right. Everyone thinks so that It's not complicated. It doesn't take mathematics. I disagree with these experts. Somebody's got to stand up to experts that are just, I think, I don't know why they're doing it. They're wonderful people. If you have never heard of Dr. Don McElroy or uh, Don McElroy was a, uh, a dentist in Texas who was a great fan of Glenn Beck. And when he watched that particular episode that I brought clips from where Glenn Beck said, your history is being stolen from you, it's being manipulated, and it's part of a liberal, communist, socialist, Nazi agenda to kill your children. As he said, well, this sounds important. So we ran for head of Texas School Board. And then we talked about this a little bit earlier in uh, one of our panels is that Texas has a great influence on America as a whole since they have the largest student population, they have the largest consumer base, and therefore the textbook publishers always look to the Texas School Board first to see what should be in the books. And all of a sudden we had a dentist who was inspired by Glenn Beck who proposed once he got on the school board to remove all reference of evolution from all books. Uh, he said Thomas Jefferson should be removed from the history books completely because as historians know, Thomas Jefferson was a, was a deist. Uh, and even though he was you know, third president of the United States, that he should simply be removed. And any references to Martin Luther King Jr. should uh, relate that he was simply a communist who hated America. They also actually proposed, if you see the little image there, that <clears throat> to no longer use the phrase uh, transatlantic slave trade, as they simply said, the Atlantic Triangle Trade, which I know that's also accepted within our sort of larger discipline. But for a high school text, there's a loaded agenda to remove the word slave. Now, the biggest challenge, I think, off the bat with undergraduate students and working with them and trying to relate with them is trying to describe to them that what they got primarily in high school is what we also talked about earlier was a, a heritage studies. You, know, you get a certain narrative because it has a certain social purpose of a, uh, making you a, an engaged citizen with the world around you. Uh, so it, it's not a rigorous investigation into things. And they always say, oh, history, it's all facts. I'm like, well, actually, that, that's not what historians do. As I say, you know, history is a scientific method of studying the human past through verifiable evidence. And that the historian's craft is not based upon fact, but upon debate and social scientific research, which means just as a scientist gets new evidence information, uh, the scientist uh, challenges their original hypotheses and keeps moving forward. I said, you know, what it means to be a historian, as I said, if I dedicate myself to a topic and spend 50 years of my life on that research, and after 50 years somebody comes up with a new collection of documents that discounts my stuff, I said, I have to be willing to take a step back after 50 years and say, I'm wrong, let's start over. I said, you have to be open. I said, it's not just about that, it's about the debates. And it freaks me out more and more. I was asked my third semester at Dixie <clears throat> to help run a panel discussion about a film they were showing on class entitled uh, Indoctrinate You, Our Education, Their Politics. And as we were watching this film, all of a sudden, they mentioned Central Michigan University. I was like, oh, well, this is interesting. Uh, and people on the panel didn't realize I was from CMU. The film stating, academics promote sympathy with the enemies of the United States. It's no surprise that the American flag was not welcome on college campuses after 9-11. Dorm residents at Central Michigan University were told to remove American flags from their doors. Liberal academics really only want freedom for their own speech. But this is a war worth winning. And tell them, remember these words. No justice, no peace. The particular incident they're referring to, because I was at Central Michigan University at that time, Mount Pleasant, Michigan, my hometown, was that one student, because all, all of the dorm rooms had American flags, uh, it happened all over college campuses, there was one student that superimposed on top of his American flag, had pictures of about a half dozen Muslims hanging from trees by nooses with their bodies set on fire. And the person who was in charge of housing said that student had to take his flag. But they used that one example and said, it happened all over and all these things, and it's obviously evidence that 
liberals are trying to destroy America, and that really the front line of that are academics and historians. Uh, it, it, it bothers me, it freaks me out, this sort of anti-intellectual aspect of it, and particularly a very non-constructive, because if our goal as historians is to promote things such as critical thought, critical investigation, then uh, yeah, we need to be able to be open to talk about that you agree with those sides. It's that that's what history is. You know, the scientist doesn't say, "I don't like uh, copper," so uh, any of my things that I do, I will just simply pretend copper doesn't exist. It's not how it works. I always try to emphasize to my students: the past is not history. The past may be lost without a trace. The past may be remembered, continually reinvented, or imagined as story. The past may be a reasonably true account or utilize as useful fiction. The past happened, how we use or remember it varies. I say the big difference, I said, you know, when you talk about the past and you talk, I said, you know, story is the root word of history, and we all, what it means to be human is that we tell stories, and that, that's good, and that's okay, I said, but history is different, because historians need documents. And even if we are aware of something in the past, if we don't have documents, we can't fully qualify it as history. I mean, there's different methodologies to try and circumvent that, but we need documents, and not all things in the past need documents. Uh, one of the things to try and help students understand that is to challenge the aspect of when they say phrases such as, this is a Christian nation, or I believe in Christian values or different things, and they try and apply that to history. Well, as we know, that different groups of Christians believe very different things, and that there's no such thing as a Christian worldview. And one of the examples I used to teach that, uh, yeah, once again, going back to the 1930s. I said, okay, Christian view of politics in the 1930s, uh, here's Father Charles Coughlin of Royal Oak, Michigan, saying, on this earth you must belong to the church militant or get the hell out of it. That's the right word, you're either with me or against me. There is no middle ground in the battle between Christ and the Antichrist. Our Christian front is an action society, not a debating society. We'll fight for you in Franco's way, we'll fight for you, and we'll win. Uh, Father Coughlin's great claim to fame in America is, uh, yeah, he's the first minister to utilize radio. And he's got about 40 million people that listen to him every single week. And when he talks about Christ and the Antichrist, he's not talking specifically in religion. He's identified that Adolf Hitler is the Messiah of the 1930s, saving Western Christian civilization from the threat of the Jew. He goes on and says, the Antichrist is President Roosevelt because he won't sign any agreements with Hitler. And when he says, we'll fight for you in Franco's way, uh, that's a reference to Francisco Franco, who was in the process of overthrowing democracy in Spain to set up a fascist dictatorship in the name of Catholic traditions in Spain. I said, so that, that's a Christian perspective here. I said, but I don't know if we, yeah, that's one I said. But you know, it's a specific Christian perspective. It's a Catholic. I said, but let's look at another Catholic from this era. Uh, Father Joseph Speaker of Cologne, Germany, where he says, Germany has only one fewer, and that is Christ. All worldly fewers and spiritual fewers are subject to this fewer. We recognize the state's authority, but we are only subject to it insofar as its laws do not stand in contradiction with the laws of our one and only fewer. Uh, you know, this is a Catholic priest in Nazi Germany uh, yeah, who gives sermons like this every Sunday. Uh, you know, and what he's saying is that you know, Hitler invokes this rhetoric of Christianity, and it's just to manipulate you. Uh, if he says that he represents Christianity, uh, yeah, if it contradicts what we teach here in the church, then yeah, don't follow his laws, because Christ is your only fewer. Uh, well, again, yeah, there's another Catholic perspective, Christian perspective, but this is one condemning it. Uh, and there's this notorious fellow uh, who has probably one of the most famous quotes ever on the Holocaust. Uh, First they came for the communists, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a communist. When they came for the trade unionists, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, I didn't speak up because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for the Catholics, I didn't speak up because I was a Protestant. Then they came for me, and by that time, no one was left to speak up. Uh, Pastor Martin Nagler, uh, who at this period uh, in the 1930s was one of the major figures of the Lutheran Church in Germany. Uh, he, he, he's not 
specifically saying is about Hitler, he's talking about the impact <coughs> on common people. The problem with something like this, yeah, this is also a Christian perspective, but it's a little bit complex, because this guy, for some reason, has gone down in history because of this quote as, a, as an opponent of Adolf Hitler. Uh, forgetting the fact that in 1937, uh, since Nazi ideology didn't line up real, real well with the fact that Jesus was a Jew, as Pastor Martin Naimler, as an ardent supporter of the Nazis, did a complete rewrite of the New Testament, saying that the story of Jesus being a Jew was something that the Catholics had made up at the Council of Nicaea, that the Jews had participated in this conspiracy, and that Jesus had actually been a great period warrior. And the only reason why they eventually came up after him was uh, he spoke out against policies right before World War II started. Uh, but this is the man culturally who laid the basis for the mindset of things such as the Holocaust. Now, once again, it's a Christian perspective. And there's this kid. <laughs> German boys, do you know the country without freedom, the country of terror and tyranny? Yes, you know it well, but are afraid to talk about it. They have intimidated you to such an extent that you don't dare talk for fear of reprisals. Yes, you are right, it is Germany, Hitler Germany. Through this unscrupulous terror tactics against young and old men and women, they have succeeded in making you spineless puppets to do their bidding. This is a young man uh, in Hamburg, Germany, who was uh, essentially asking other young men to disobey the laws of the land to be uh, insubordinate to the state. And he's a Mormon. Uh, young Helen Huber, uh, in 1943, after news came about the Battle of Stalingrad, because his grandparents had a, a radio that could get BBC broadcasts, his uh, helmet listened in on that, realized that Hitler just helped mass murder about a million young Germans. And yeah, he uh, talked with his bishop and said, you know, I'd like to help out with the newsletter, but you know, there's curfews going on and I'm only 14 years old. Can I borrow your typewriter and keep it at home? And I'll do all the newsletter work in there. He said, oh yeah, sure. And you know, Helmut went back there and he was using that to, uh, you know, to write underground newspapers calling for the overthrow of the government. And he was caught. That's another Christian perspective. And it, it, it takes this concept of, you know, Hitler good, Hitler bad, and not instead of the simple binary, it's a, it's a complex issue. And that a phrase such as a, a, a Christian perspective is actually a really meaningless phrase. And the historian needs phrases that are specific to specific contexts. Uh, the other part is trying to classify people's experiences. Uh, because, uh, yeah, cognitive dissonance, all these different things, is people think that if you say something to them that they've never heard before, that either there's some conspiracy to keep the knowledge away, or you're lying to them, trying to indoctrinate them. Uh, so what I try to do right off the bat is once again, hit the purple elephant. Uh, one of the reasons why I use Larry Schweiger's book <clears throat> is that in his introduction to it, because he, he's very good at selling books, it's him having an interview with Rush Limbaugh, where he says, I know liberals go nuts when you talk about whether certain people were put in place by God. George Washington was set in the office by God himself because no other human could have done that job. Uh, and I asked my students, I said, you know, how many of you on a personal level would agree with this? And particularly in something you've done, usually in about 67% of students would raise their hand. Like, cool. I said, that's fine if you believe that. I said, now what's the problem qualifying that as history? Like, ah, uh, like, what we're missing here, uh, verifiable evidence. I, I said, can you go to the National Archives and find a document signed by God that says, I make George Washington president? And they said, no. I said, well, then th this is a historic statement. And the reason why it's in the introduction is, yeah, Larry has told me before, he said, you know, his market is uh, not academics, it's old Walmart. And people see a book on the shelf there that has an American flag, it says Patriot, they pick it up, like, oh, interview with Rush Limbaugh, it says stuff like that. And then after the introduction, uh, yeah, then he gets into serious historic scholarship. But yeah, but, but most of it's a huge book, so people read the introduction and they buy it. Uh, you know, I asked Larry once if he believed in everything they wrote, and he said, I believe my book was uh, number one on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> <laughs> At least he's honest about it. Uh, but for the fact, that I don't try and discount my students' values or make them feel uncomfortable as I say, what we need to differentiate in the human experience is 
evidence of history and science and, and, and statements of faith.